Okay, we are live. Waiting for some folks to come on. And uh, hopefully they'll be popping up. Want to welcome all our media family uh, from Sunday night uh, till through the week and the weeks to come. Here comes our first person. God bless you. Um, just give me, as you're coming on, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay and see me okay. All right. Praise God. <clears throat> so if you could do that. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I got a thumbs up for sound. And uh, so good. Good. All right. Welcome on. Don't see any names yet. I see your faces up on top. So I'm going to guess at some of you. Well, I'm not even going to try to guess. I'll wait till your names come up on the side. Uh, trying to see who the first person was. Hi, Sister Joanne. Nice to see you. Somebody has a picture, it looks like, of two dogs. Um, they're very small pictures, so I'm trying to make them out. Um, so just uh, let me know that you're on down below. Uh, log on. And there you go, Sister Thais. Nice to see you. Amen. Sister, oh, that's you, Sister Chris. Okay. Uh, is it two dogs? Is that what it is? Sister Dora. Sister Gloria Levine. How are you? Good to see you. Amen. So, trying to figure out who that first person was that came on. Hey, how you doing, uh, Brother Roger Savoy? Nice to see you. Sister Chandra, nice to see you. God bless you. Hi, Mama. Always nice to see my Mama online. And Sister Judy, God bless you. Uh, we miss you, Sister Judy. Recover quickly. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yolanda was the first. Okay. So you, is that Yolanda with glasses? Um, and the, that was the first one that popped up. Good evening. No, no, that's not the person. Hi, Sister Yolanda, Sister Tamara. I can't uh, make out the face, but it's a lady with glasses, has a brick wall behind her. Um, well, welcome, whoever you are. I'm sure you're one of our people, but I just couldn't. It's hard to see these little pictures, you know. Um, but it's nice to see you put up your name. Praise God. Well, it was a beautiful day today. Um, uh, they say, I don't know, I've heard different things about some storm coming. But when I went to look online, it didn't seem like anything was happening in our area. Maybe some other parts of the country or something. I don't know. But we'll see. Um, hopefully we'll hold off uh, winter a little bit longer and get spring coming in quickly. I guess March comes in like a lion and leaves like a lamb, right? Is that what they say? <clears throat> and then we have April. And what happens in April, everybody? April what? What happens in April? April showers, right? April showers bring what? What do they bring? All right, come on. Somebody post it, you know. April showers bring what? Good evening, Sister Laura. God, God bless you. April showers bring May flowers. May flowers. Flowers in your birthday. Okay, yes, Thais got it. Thais is the winner. May flowers. Now, April showers. All right, my mom got it too. Hey, Rick, Ricky and Carol, nice to see you. Uh, yep, May flowers. Now, what do May flowers bring? What do May flowers bring? You have thirty seconds. Da, 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 da. Pilgrims. That's right. Sister Gloria Levine is the winner. Pilgrims. Hey, there you go, Brother Roger. Hi, Sister Kim. Nice to see you. I know these are getting a little corny here, but, um, you know, 
It is what it is. So, um, nice to see everybody. We'll just wait a, a couple of more uh, seconds, a little while for some more. Thank you for your po your hearts and your thumbs up. Amen. Did you hear about the man who went to the doctor? And he said, doctor, I think I'm invisible. Doctor, I think I'm invisible. The doctor said, who said that? Oh, that, that was bad. That was bad. <laughs> wow, Sister Amak Pari from Florida. What are you, you're on vacation? Are you on vacation? Brother Galen, how are you? Sister Pearl, nice to see you. Sister Amak Pari is in Florida. Wow, that's great. Oh, I got some chuckles on that one. Yeah, you like that one, huh? How about the other guy? This guy, oh, I like how God touched my, yeah, that's wonderful, Sister Laura. God is so good, so faithful, amen. Well, another man walked into the doctor's office, and he had a pelican on his head. So the pelican said, doctor, how do I get this guy out from underneath me? Boom. Boom. That's terrible. They, these, are, these are really corny. These are old. <laughs> Anyways, praise God. Hallelujah. It's good to have a good sense of humor. Celebrate a family graduation. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, that one was bad, Chris. You got it. Hi, Sister Danielle. Amen. Praise God. Jokes are fun. Amen. Family friend. Okay, good. I hope you're having a good time there with your friends in Florida. Amen. All right. All right. How, how many likes reading books? Amen. Yeah. Did you ever read The Bird Book by Robin C. Gull? <laughs> what would you think of that one, Chris? <laughs> the Bird Book by Robin C. Gull. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I got a couple of laughs. Okay, that was good. Yeah. All right. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna get started. Looks like uh, most folks around. I might get a couple of more. Yeah, I like I like I got a couple more of those book ones. Uh, do you want to hear one more? That one was gold. Do you want to hear one more, folks? I need a vote. Hi, Sister Emily. Nice to see you. Amen. Okay. Did you ever read Over the Cliff by You Go First? <laughs> oh, boy. That was terrible. It is good to have fun. And, you know, that's part, a little bit part of my message tonight uh, is not a, as much about fun as about having a balance of some things uh, in life because, you know, life isn't always all serious. And, and you know, I mean, we live in a serious world. We live in a world where if we're not careful, it seems all that you see is what's bad about the world. But, you know, the Bible reminds us, though, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Nature, yeah. Also by Eileen Daly. That's right, another author. It's actually Tragedy on the Cliff by Eileen Dover. Okay, let's let's go let's go on. Okay, amen. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for your giving. Uh thank you for uh keeping our church doors open to save souls and to 
make a difference in our community and also through our missions program reaching out various parts of the world. And uh, if you would like to give tonight, maybe you're visiting tonight for the first time or in the next week or so as people come on and you share, you may share this with others, um, there's a couple of ways that you can give to support our church, and we'd be so grateful if you could. One way is um, you could actually send your offering by mail, a check, to FGIC, P.O. Box 4017, Manchester, Connecticut, 06045. Another uh, way that's, uh, if you like using the uh, internet, is to go to our website, fgichurch.org, and just hit the Give Now button. It's very simple, and just follow the instructions. And then if you like using apps on your phone, you can download the Easy Tithe app. We belong to that. And look up FGI Church Manchester, and you'll find us. Amen. Hi, Brother Carl. Hi, Emma, Mary. Hi, Shoni. Nice to see you tonight. Amen. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. So tonight, I want to talk about a thought that came to me. And it's interesting because the title of my message tonight is Labor to Rest. Labor to Rest or Work to Rest. Interesting uh, choice of words, don't you think? Uh, Kind of What's this about? Well, let's take a look in the Bible. Uh, And we'll be preaching a lot from the book of Hebrews, the New Testament. And I just want to read a couple of scriptures in Hebrews chapter 4, and then we'll make some other references as we go on. Uh, It's it's a vast subject, but I'm going to try to keep it more condensed tonight to, to just show you the promise of what God made to us, especially in the days that we're living in. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And I want to read that again. If you have your Bibles, please follow along with me so you can see it in the Word of God. That's important. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 is actually a continuation of Hebrews 3. So if you can read the end of Hebrews 3 into verse 1 of 4, you'll kind of see a picture. But he says, Let us therefore fear this, lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And then in verse, uh, in chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 11, It says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Let us labor or work to enter into his rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So let's have a word of prayer before we go on. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today in your precious name of Jesus, Lord, and Help us to understand this promise that you have given us in your word. Lord, you want your people to experience rest, peace, love, joy in the Holy Ghost. But that rest, Lord, is so important in the day we live in. We live in a day, especially in the United States, uh, of of the the, the race, you know, the the movement, the everything bombarded daily with news and, and activities and, and reports and, and just the, the social media. It just never seems to end. Somewhere your people must, must work to enter into the rest that you have provided for us. Help us to find that tonight. In your wonderful name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. So it's kind of funny that this scripture says labor to rest. It's funny. It's like counterproductive, right? If we're working, how can we rest? How can we take a break if we're trying to get a job done? But he's not talking about work in the sense of physical demanding labor. 
He's talking about the labor, the work that may overcome us because it's too much for us. You know, the toils of life, the cares of life, the things that we face on a daily basis sometimes. Did you ever have, a, you know, a day that just seemed to go that way? It just seemed to say one thing after another, you know, and this is what God is trying to show us in these scriptures. The writer of Hebrews is telling us there is a rest for the people of God. There is a peace for the people of God, even in the midst of the worst turmoil. And this is what we have to learn to understand. This is a promise of God. Now, um, this promise even was given by Jesus himself. He confirms this. When, when he called out to all that, uh, that labor, but are heavy laden, see, by their toils, by their work. In other words, it's, the work is, is counterproductive. The work isn't blessing them. It's, it's draining them. The labor of life itself sometimes can drain you of, of, of your strength. The, the labor of when you hear some of the things we hear in the news, and, and, and if we're not careful, it seems like there is no hope. It's one thing after another, and you have to be careful because there seems to be no answer to this, and the world is struggling to find the answers, but the world without Jesus cannot find the rest that God is talking about here. So, Jesus said, when you're heavy laden with the struggles and cares of life, you can rest from those labors, but you can work for God in peace and with strength and with joy. See, the work of the Lord is not going to drain you. The work of Jesus Christ only will give you strength and power. Because he gave us the Holy Spirit. He said, you'll be witnesses of me. Go and witness. Go and tell all nations that I, what I've shown you, what I've taught you, what I've commanded you. Teach all nations my gospel. Teach them. Let them learn about me. Now, we find those words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He's not talking about natural work. He's talking about laboring with a problem, laboring with a circumstance, laboring with sorrow, laboring with a hurt in life. Come unto me, Jesus says, all you that are hurting, that are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wow. Isn't that great? Jesus wants to give you rest. I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight, and maybe it's not so much the folks here, uh, although this is God's promise to all of us, and myself included, but he's also reaching out to those who might be struggling and don't know what to do. Well, Jesus offers you a place of rest, place of peace for your heart, for your mind, and for your body. Amen. He said, I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. A yoke is the uh, a, a connection to him where you're yoked together, connected together. He said, become connected to me, connected to me, and then learn of me. Learn about me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. What is Jesus saying here to us? He's saying, listen, I understand your problem. I understand your struggle. I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart. I'm not so high above you that I can't feel what you're going through. I just want you to know that tonight. Jesus cares about you and he wants to lift the heavy burden off of you and give you rest. I hope by the end of this message, you will release that heavy burden to Jesus. Release it to him and let him give you rest. 
And he says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, I'm telling you, when you get into that place of rest in your soul, all hell could be breaking loose all around you. But inside is a paradise of peace. People don't understand that. They don't understand how you can be so calm when everything is going wrong. How does that happen? Well, we've entered into his rest. We've entered into his peace. We're not allowing those situations to control our emotions. Now, will there be times when our emotions will be touched? Absolutely. Times of loss of a loved one, you know, the death of someone we really love. It's going to touch our heart. It's going to cause us to grieve. It's going to cause us to miss that person. But even in the midst of grieving, even in the midst of the, the hardest time, you still can find rest for your soul. Your soul doesn't have to be overwhelmed by it to a place where it starts to cause you to have unbelief in God. And this is the danger of struggles, the danger of things that we go through. If it's not checked properly by the word of God, if it's not given to Jesus, we try to carry it ourselves. We have to be careful that it doesn't overwhelm us to the place where we no, no longer believe. And that's what happened to the Israelites. We're going to talk about that for a second. How did unbelief enter their heart? Well, obstacles, problems. Not Instead of looking to God to help them, they tried to solve it themselves. And we don't have the power to overcome some of the things that's coming on this world. He said, we need to pray that we will escape the things that are coming on this world. Amen? Escape that great tribulation that's coming. Amen. <clears throat> so what happened to the early believers in the Old Testament? Why did, did the writer of Hebrews bring this to our attention? He used them as an example. And it was the exodus of Israel out of Egypt going to the promised land. They seen the mighty miracles of God. They passed through the Red Sea on dry land. They saw the pillar of fire at night and the cloud by day that led them into the wilderness. And they came to the promised land. And when they came to the promised land, they chose 12 men, one from each tribe, to go and spy out the land and bring back a report to Moses. And two of those men we know were Joshua and Caleb. And there was 10 other princes among Israel, uh, of, among the people, leaders of the tribes. So what happened is they went to the promise, they went to scope out the land, and they saw some pretty, pretty hard things. They saw great walled cities. They saw uh, insurmountable odds of armies. They saw... Uh, the, the, the hardship of winning that land. They even saw themselves as grasshoppers in their sight. You've got to be pretty low esteem to think of yourself as a grasshopper in front of another human being. Did you ever feel that way, like you were nothing? That's how they felt because all they could see, and this was 10 of the spies, Ten of the spies only saw the obstacles and the challenges, and they convinced themselves that they could not overcome those challenges. So they came back with an evil report, the Bible says. Why was it an evil report? I looked into that. When Joshua and Caleb came back, they saw the exact same things that the other ten spies saw. But they were the only ones that said, hey, this land is a land that flows with milk and honey. This land has grapes so big we had to carry it on a staff between us. This is a wonderful land that God's going to give us. Let's go up and take it. And what was the difference between the two reports? One succumbed to unbelief. One gave into faith. Because Joshua and Caleb said, let us go up and take the land, for God has given us into our hands. They remind me of David. David went to face the giant. The Israel saw a giant they could not defeat. They saw a giant so big they could not defeat it. 
David saw a giant so small that he could defeat him. <laughs> what was the difference? The perspective of their faith. You see, unbelief is the opposite of faith. Unbelief can get a hold of anyone if we let it by by questioning things and, and looking at all the, the drama and all the bad things that are happening in the world. Then all of a sudden you start asking yourself, where is God? Is there a God? I've seen Christians fall to this and, and, and end up not believing in God anymore because they look too much on the wrong side of the coin. Yeah, if I look at the news every day and listen, if I scan the internet for all the bad things that are happening in this world, there's a thousand of them. But then how many of us are scanning for the good things that are happening in the world? Because there's thousands of those too. But you don't hear much about those except in church. The church is where you hear good reports. Amen? So so the example was the Israelites. In Hebrews 4, 2, the writer explains what happened. He said, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. They heard the message. They heard the promises of God, the land of milk and honey. They heard the word, but the word did preach to them, did not profit them, not being mixed in faith in them that heard it. The re this rest was offered to God's people in the Old Testament, but they simply did not believe in it. They did not believe God could bring them through. And they let unbelief take over their heart. Now, unbelief, I looked up the word unbelief. It's not just a disbelief. It is disbelief in God, but it's also a stubborn opposition. It's a stubborn opposition. I've seen this happen to people. It's funny. I've seen one man story. Um, he, he used to preach with Billy Graham, a great preacher. And uh, he, he had faith just like Billy Graham did. As a matter of fact, they preached together, won hundreds and thousands of young people to Christ in his early days. And uh, as he was out going through his life, he went and saw the Holocaust film that was being shown at that time. He saw how the Jews were being killed and their bodies dumped into, into those fire pits to be burned. And, and he started questioning God. He started saying, God, how can you allow this to happen to your people? Where are you? And then he, they show him in the story, they showed him going to a hospital and seeing a girl just, uh, that he went to pray for just terrible accident, her body torn apart and, God, why? God, why this? God, why that? And what happened is, what happened is he started looking at all the bad things that were happening and it got a hold of his life. And then he started talking to Billy Graham about it. And Billy Graham started feeling the despair that this man started feeling. What was the difference between those two men though? Well, when Billy Graham started feeling down about what he was saying, because when you start talking about uh, unbelief to other people, you, you can sow seeds of unbelief in their life. You can bring them down. That's why you need to be careful who you talk to about your faith. Make sure you talk about your faith to people who have faith, that believe in God. Because all the, sometimes all people see is the bad stuff of life. So what was the difference between the two men? Well, Billy Graham called his mother, talked to his mother at that time. And this is when they were a little younger. And he said to his mother, I'm struggling. And his mother reminded him of the promises of God. He said, Billy, remember what God did for you. And in the, and in the, the uh, documentary, it shows him going to prayer. Billy Graham went to prayer. And he started praying, asking, God, help me, Lord, I'm struggling. It seems as if unbelief is trying to creep into my life. And all of a sudden, God showed him when he got saved, when his sister got saved. When he preached to the first man that he witnessed to, a black man who got saved. And then he showed him all the hundreds of people that got saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then it, it just recharged his faith and recommitted his life to God. What happened to his friend? His friend never went to prayer to ask God. He never went to God. And he ended up writing a book called Farewell to God. It ate him up so bad 
Now, I'm hoping that somehow in the end, maybe he found his way back. I don't know. I didn't get that far in the story to see if he did. He may have. I hope he did. But it's just a, an example of what can happen to someone when you leave God out of your equation, okay? This is what happened to the Israelites. He says, we cannot defeat this enemy. If we go into this land, we will be destroyed. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're going to, they're going to kill us. And the other two men came up and said, no, no, don't do that. They even rent their clothes and said, no, remember God's promise. He said, go up and take the land. Surely it is yours. And in Hebrews 3, 18 and 19, we see the re end result of their unbelief. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They didn't make it. And if you read your Bible, you'll know that that God had them wander through the wilderness for 40 years while that generation that distrusted God and disbelieved God were gone and a new generation rose up with faith that Joshua and Caleb were able to lead into the promised land. Amen? Amen. Faith wins in the end. Uh, the Bible says, what is, what is the victory that overcomes the world? Even our Faith. Amen. Have faith in God no matter what you see, no matter what you feel, no matter what you're going through, no matter how much it hurts. Physically, mentally, go to God in prayer. Believe God. Believe Him and His promises. Hang on to His promises. We used to sing a song called Standing on the Promises of God. Amen. Stand on them. Amen. How... How could they not believe in God after all the miracles they witnessed? When they were hungry, God fed them with manna. When they needed water, God gave them a rock that followed them, that supplied water. I mean, they were well taken care of. What happened? Well, what is unbelief? Unbelief, unbelief sees more in the things that hinder than in God's promise to help. In other words, on the scale of justice or the balance, the scale is tipped in favor of all the bad things, the things that hinder me. I can't do this because of this. I can't do that because of that. You know, what's the use? Anybody ever say that to themselves? I might as well quit. Might as well give up. These are words of leaning into unbelief. And we have to be careful that we do not let that get into our heart and take over. Amen. We all have those days. Don't get me wrong. We're human. There's days when we are lower in our faith than others. But we must remember God's promise no matter what. Amen. Amen. So unbelief sees more in the things that hinder than in God's promise to help. The Israelites sent spies into the land, 12 of them. 10 came back with hindrances and were afraid. Joshua and Caleb came back filled with faith and reminded the people of God's promise. Therefore, unbelief looks at the impossibility and magnifies the impossibility rather than God's promises of possibility. Every one of God's promises are promises of possibility. Amen. They shall happen, God says, if you believe. All things are possible to him that believes. Amen? See, faith sees the love in the heart of Christ when he speaks, seeks to help us. Unbelief sees anger in God's heart when God says that he loves us. It's contrary, you see? It's the opposite of faith. It's the opposite of love. We don't think God loves us anymore. That's unbelief. The good out of the way, the bad. That's right. The good outweighs the bad every time. Amen. But with us, as Christians, everything that happens to us is not necessarily bad. There are going to be some struggles and trials, but Peter said in, the, in his epistle, think it not strange when these fiery trials come upon you, as if some strange thing happened to you. But remember, they're going to try you so that you could come forth like gold. You know, 
Win the contest of the trial. Put your faith in Jesus and come forth like gold. Amen. So faith sees the love of God. There was an honest man in the Bible that came to Jesus asking him to heal his son of a deaf and dumb possession. He was possessed by an evil spirit that made him deaf and dumb. You'll find the account in Mark chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, you have to understand, this man brought this his son to the disciples. This son started renting his clothes and foaming at the mouth and rolling in the dirt. I mean, he, it was a scary sight. The disciples could not cast the enemy out of him. So he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, please help us. Please help my son. So Jesus says to him, Mark 9, 23, 24, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Now this man, I like him, his honesty, his honesty. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I'm struggling. I don't see how this can happen, Lord. Did you ever, were you ever in that place where you said in prayer, I just don't see how it's going to end, how it's going to happen? Well, you're not alone. You're not alone. But I like his honesty. He said, but Lord, help my unbelief. I have a struggle. Help me. And Jesus answered that honest prayer and set his son free. Amen. Amen. You see, I think sometimes being honest with God is more important than anything in the world. It, tell him of your struggle. Talk to him. He's your friend. I was talking to Jesus yesterday and said, you're my best friend, Jesus. You're my best friend, and I want you to be happy with me as a friend of you. You know, we can talk to God like that. We can talk to Jesus like that. God is our Father, right? Jesus is our is our high priest that went into the heavens. Amen. So there remains a rest, the Bible says, for the people of God. There is a resting place for every one of us. And it's called the spiritual Sabbath. And it's not just once a week anymore, but it's every day with Jesus. Every day I can have rest for my soul. My soul doesn't have to enter into the turmoils of this world. My soul can be at perfect peace with Jesus. So therefore there remains a complete and Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the ones who had once entered into his rest also rested from the weariness and pain of his human labors. Just as God rested from those labors that were uniquely his own. Even God rested on the seventh day. Why? Why is this, why is this Sabbath so important to God? Why did, why did he tell us in the Old Testament to remember the Sabbath, keep it holy? You know, I created the six days, I created the world and the universe, but the seventh day I rested. Why? Because he knew that we would need rest. Some people, you know, they, they never stop. And they get sick because they never stop. I've got to go on. I've got to keep going. got to keep going. got to keep going. Watch out. Watch out. God, you know, it's funny that the human body needs to sleep. Isn't it? Isn't it funny it's natural for us to go to sleep? It's a, it's a cycle that God created within us to get rest so that we can be rejuvenated. And while we sleep, everything's being re revived and rejuvenated within us. And then if you're fortunate, you have great dreams while you're sleeping. Amen. Praise God. There's a rest. Let us therefore, verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest of God, to know it and experience it for ourselves. Amen. So that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience as those who died in the wilderness. 
See, they let the, the circumstances overwhelm them to a point where they became obstinate and said, we're not going. We're not going to follow you, Moses, anymore. We're not going to follow God. And Moses stood in the gap for them that day. Thank God he did, or they would have been wiped out. You know the story. If you're a Christian, you've read it. It was, it was Moses who saved them. It was Moses' grace who saved them, his prayer that day. And blessed rest from the toils and troubles of this life. This rest is in Jesus Christ. It's also called peace that passes all understanding. Amazing grace. I'm glad you said that, Sister Emily, because that's where we find this rest. In, at, in and at the throne of grace. Throne of grace. In my closing scripture, I just want to exhort a little bit on Hebrews 4:14. 4, Listen to this, and this is from the Amplified Bible. Inasmuch then as we believers, we believers have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession of faith and cling tenaciously to the absolute trust in him as a Savior. This is what we're labor. This is what we're fighting for. Fighting the good fight of faith is laboring for the faith, laboring for that rest, that peace. Sometimes you've got to fight for it and don't let it go. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us. Listen to me, all you that are hurting tonight, both physically and spiritually. Listen to me. We have a high priest who sympathizes and understands our weaknesses and temptations. He is one who has been tempted himself and knows exactly how it feels to be a human being. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus knows how it feels to be human. Jesus knows how to feel pain. You know, we don't notice Jesus having pain in the Bible necessarily, but do you think that those long walks didn't make him tired? Do you think that when he was hungry one day, he went through a cornfield and took some ears of corn and rubbed them between his hands to warm him up so he could eat it? Did Jesus need water sometimes? Did Jesus need food sometimes? Yes, he understands everything that we go through, all of it. He was tempted in every like manner, yet without sin. He's felt every temptation of man, but without sin. He was sinless and guiltless before God. He knows how it feels to be human in every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. Therefore, verse 16, therefore let us, let us with our, a privilege, listen to this. Tonight, when you go to the throne of grace for your need, I want you to go up there as a privilege to you, given to you by God. It's a privilege. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a privilege. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace. He didn't say, come hanging your head in, in shame. And he didn't say, come, uh, you know, you know, doubting and, and struggling and poor me. He said, come boldly. Say, Lord, you've given me access to this throne. I'm coming. I'm coming. I have a need, and I know you're going to meet that need tonight. Hallelujah. I want you to have that kind of faith right now. Let that rise up within your heart. Listen to this. Let us with privilege approach the throne of grace. That is the throne of God's gracious favor with confidence and without fear so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace, Sister Emily, his amazing grace to help in the time of need an appropriate blessing coming at just the right moment. Ah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So let's go to prayer right now. 
Let's keep get this faith that's in our heart right now. And let's release it to God and let us come to his throne of grace right now. Lord Jesus, we come to your throne, Lord, in the spirit. You said in the spirit, you'll cause us to sit in heavenly places with you. Bring us there in the spirit right now, Lord. Everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice, bring them to your throne of grace right now, Lord. Hallelujah. We have needs, Lord. I have needs in my life. God, I bring them to your throne. I believe you, Lord. I believe your promise of healing, of miracles. I believe, Lord, that you can heal our bodies tonight. Touch us where we're hurting. Touch those that are hurting in their body tonight that's listening to this broadcast or, or in the days to come. Touch them in their body right now. Relieve them of that, that pain. Go to the source of it, Lord, and heal it. Heal our bodies. Heal our minds. Heal our hearts, Lord, from hurts and past disappointments. God, cause us to rise up like an eagle. You said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, God, praise you, Jesus. I feel his presence right now. I feel it in, in this room where I'm preaching from. I feel his presence going out to you. Accept it tonight. Say, thank you, Lord. Let's praise him for a moment. Let's lift up our hands and just thank him and praise him for this presence that we feel right now. Lord, we thank you for coming to visit us. Hallelujah. And healing us. Thank you for healing my body, Lord. Thank you for healing my mind, Lord. Thank you for giving me strength to say no to the temptations of life. Thank you, Lord, for causing me to, to look to you in love, Lord, and look to my brother and sisters in love and to our neighbors out there in love. Help me to love you with all my heart, soul, and strength, and let me love my neighbor as myself. Lord, help us to fulfill your great commission in the day we live in. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Oh, just take a minute to praise him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's sing a song in closing. We give thanks to thee, O Lord, we give thanks. We give thanks to thee, O Lord, we give thanks. For thy name is near. Thy wondrous works men declare. We give thanks to thee, O Lord. We give thanks. Come on, let's sing it together. We give thanks to thee, O Lord. We give thanks. We give thanks to thee, O Lord. We give Thanks, for thy name is near. Thy wondrous works men declare. We give thanks to thee, O Lord. We give thanks. Let's sing it one more time. We give thanks to thee, O Lord. We give thanks. We give thanks to thee, O Lord, we give thanks. For thy name is near, thy wondrous works men declare. We give thanks to thee, O Lord, we give thanks. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Keep thanking them the rest of the night. Thank him through the week. Hallelujah. Find a song to sing when you get up in the morning and, and find that place of rest every day that you live. Every day that you live, enter into his rest. God bless you. Uh, tonight is so great to be with you. Thank you for being here tonight. And please share this with others. Praise God. Please share with those that you might think might need this. Uh, some friends and, and things like that. Thank you for all, and all of you have a blessed week too. God bless you all. Amen.